Well, hello to all my tubular friends and enemas. It's good to see you. Well, I can't see you, of course, but welcome to another Vegematic show. Another Saturday, another week goes by as we head further into the Doomosphere. But the Doomosphere is kind of a, uh, an interesting place because we get to say, I told you so a lot. But that really doesn't cut it when it comes down to what's going on. But I figured that the best thing to do is to push forward, uh, be doomed, but push, push back against the doom. Now, fight the gathering gloom, so to speak. Yes, fight it. Fight it deeply, intrinsically. Fight it with every fiber of your being before before we're all wiped out. Look at Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale experienced the rainiest day in its history Wednesday, a one in 1,000 year rainfall event, sparking a flash flood emergency in Broward County that has prompted emergency rescues, forced drivers to abandon cars, shuttered schools, and shut down the airport through 5 a.m. Friday. And more rain is on the way. The region recorded widespread rainfall totals of more than foot, while Fort Lauderdale tallied 25.91 inches in a 24-hour period, according to preliminary reports from the National Weather Service Office. Man, Florida, uh, you don't want to go down to Florida, believe me. It's a scary place run by scary people, and they run around with guns strapped to them and everything. You boys ain't from around here, are you? It's really quite different from what it was in the 70s. Now, in the 70s, I remember spending lots of time down in Florida on Daytona Beach and hanging out with the locals and getting high. And it wasn't that scary, although back then other things were scary. While the rain Thursday won't reach nearly the amounts that fell on Wednesday, it will be problematic and create additional flooding, the National Weather Service said. Gusty winds, small hail, and even isolated tornadoes are possible. A flood warning is in effect for portions of Broward County until noon Thursday. A flood watch is in effect through Thursday evening. Between 14 and 20 inches of rain have drenched the greater Fort Lauderdale metro area since Wednesday afternoon, according to a Thursday morning update from the National Weather Service office in Miami. The deluge is the most severe flooding that I've ever seen, one neighbor said. This amount of rain in a 24-hour period is incredibly rare for South Florida, said meteorologist Anna Torres Vasquez from the Weather Service's Miami forecast office. Everything's scary in life. You notice that? Do you feel scared? Are you anxious for your future and the future of the planet? Uh, well, I would say you have a good reason to be anxious, but still, we can somehow eke out in these waning days of civilization. We can somehow get a little bit of happiness into our lives, a little bit of joy, a little bit of joie de vivre, you know, like the French burning shit down. But that isn't what I'm here to talk about. What am I here to talk about? I haven't got a clue. I do word salads weekly and then edit it all together. So how it comes out is, is anybody's guess. It's just the, the luck of the draw. Some days I'm on, some days I'm not, some days I'm feeling like, I, why do I have to keep doing this every week? And other, other days I go, well, I guess there's a reason, and it's because I connect with people. So, of course, the usual weird weather keeps happening. Rainfall of 20 to 25 inches is similar to what the area can receive with a high-end hurricane over more than a day, Torres Vasquez explained. She described the rainfall as a 1 in 1,000 year event, or greater, meaning it's an event so intense, the chance of it happening in any given year is just 0.1%. During the peak of Wednesday's deluge, a month's worth of rain fell in just one hour. Fort Lauderdale's average rainfall in April is 3 inches, and it's been nearly 25 years since the city totaled 20 inches of rain in an entire month. Now we're into this really hot spell, uh, 27, 28 degrees Celsius, and sunny and, and warm, and next week we're possibility of snow, so I, I don't know, it's up and down, it's the whiplash weather, like Professor Beckwith talks about. It's just something that we're going to have to learn to not live with because we won't be able to live with it because we're all doomed. Extreme rainfall is a signature consequence of a warming climate, and it is happening more frequently. The deluge in South Florida is just the latest instance after one in one thousand years of the Eastern Kentucky and Yellowstone. Even though the heavy rain is moving, numerous roads will be close, the weather service said, adding that flooding is expected to persist. Earlier, Fort Lauderdale was experiencing severe flooding in multiple areas of the city. Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue said on social media, warning to stay off the roads as vehicles may become stuck or submerged. But just because we're all doomed doesn't mean that in our hearts we can't feel something. See, I still feel it beating in there. It's, it's, it's going, and, and it's still keeping me alive long beyond my best before date. Speaking of going on beyond your best before date, what is it with these politicians? I'm thinking of Dianne Feinstein, uh, 90 years old or something, and she won't quit. She won't resign. No, she wants to hang on to the power till that last little bit of breath it leaves her body. Why are these psychopaths, and, and I would put probably 90% of politicians into this category, why did they find it so hard to let go of any power they have? Because I guess power is addictive, or is it like Henry Kissinger said, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac? I don't know. I've never really had a powerful aphrodisiac since I've never really needed one because I walked around for most of my life uh, as a walking hormone and, and now I, 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 it's an ugly story, I can't get into it, maybe one day I will get into it. 
Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. So today we are going to talk about Jordan again up there in Congress and another hearing that is being put together and the uh, likely outcome of it. In the attempt to draw attention away from other things that are going on in New York, looks like Jordan's going to be putting together a hearing talking about the rates up there. This is something we have talked about on the channel before. Jordan may not know it yet, but he's about to fall into a trap. But Humpty Dumpty didn't fall. He was pushed. And in this case, Humpty Dumpty was pushed by an echo chamber that in many ways he helped facilitate. If you look over social media, if you look into right-wing echo chambers. What you find is the term Democrat-run cities in conjunction with high crime rates. This is something that has created the perception that large cities have higher crime rates. What has actually occurred, and I have another video I will put down below that goes into this in detail and actually goes through lists and shows how this works. What occurs is the people that put these top 10 most dangerous cities or whatever these lists together, they set it to where the minimum population to be included is 200,000 or, you know, whatever. Um, the higher it is, the higher the likelihood that all of the cities that would be eligible would be Democrat run because large cities trend to blue. So it has created this perception that blue cities lead to high crime. However, if you do it at the county level or you drop the population requirement, what you find out is that a lot of rural areas or medium sized cities have higher crime rates, have higher violent crime rates than places like Chicago or New York. Many of those are in Ohio. I have a feeling that somebody who is actually involved in the criminal justice system, like people related to the district attorney's office in New York, they might know that. They might actually understand, you know, the basic statistics. It feels like there's going to be some funny moments coming up where Republicans ask questions, believing they know the answer because of Fox News or some other right-wing outlet, and then realize they're wrong because they don't understand the methodology that was used to put those lists together. If you really want to get into how this works, and I, I strongly suggest it because this practice is not just limited to crime rates. So if you understand how they get these charts, you'll kind of inoculate yourself against it. I'll put that video down there, definitely watch it, and you will see how rural areas tend to have higher rates than even those that are villainized the most, the, the large cities that are villainized the most, like Chicago. It does not appear that they're aware of this fact. It, it appears that they actually have bought into a, a, they believe their own propaganda. Something has been told and has been put out there to fearmonger for so long that those who probably had a hand in creating that image now believe it themselves. Those numbers are not gonna go the way the uh, Republicans in this hearing plan, because the second they drop the population requirement, the second they look at it from the county level, the second they just compare per capita rates, it's going to be funny. This may be one of the first ones I actually tune in to watch. Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good day. I've heard you talk about parents' rights to raise their kids how they want. In fact, I just double-checked. You voted no on making it illegal for kids to be married to adults at the age of 12 if their parents consented to it. You said, actually, that should be the law because it's the parents' right and the kids' right to decide what's best for them, to be raped by an adult. Okay? Do you know any kids who have been With married marriage. at age 12? That any, was the law. You, know you voted kids? not to change it. Do you know any kids who have been married at age 12? I, I don't need to. I do. Uh, and guess what? They're still married. Mike Moon, a deacon at a church, later added context, quote, something that is often missing is the backstory. With regard to my answer, I did not discuss the details. A 12-year-old impregnated a minor of similar age. With consent of the parents, they married and are still married today, Moon wrote. Her parents consented. No force. Their marriage is thriving. So there's that. But this doesn't let the likes of Moon and Missouri Republicans off the hook. See, citing an analysis by the Sahiri Justice Center, the Post-Dispatch reported that 7,000 plus teens under 18 were married in Missouri from 2000 to 2014. 85% of them were girls. According to the research, 52 Missouri girls under 15 were married in 2007. One third of those marriages feature grooms in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So you can understand why someone would assume the worst in this situation. Furthermore, Missouri minor consent laws dictate that all 12 year olds in Missouri are below the age of consent for anything under any circumstances. However, it also seems like women in Missouri can't get a divorce while pregnant. So, back to SB 49. If passed, the bill would ban healthcare providers from performing gender-affirming surgeries on any minor or from prescribing or administering cross-sex hormones or puberty-blocking drugs to a minor for a gender transition, unless such minor was receiving such treatment prior to August 28th, 2023. This in a state where when it comes to being married with children, grooming and sexual assault is affirmed with care. These are the trailblazers, the pathfinders, the Daniel Boons of progressive identity politics. This is Rachel Dolezal, a woman who pretended to be black and eventually became the president of her local chapter of the NAACP. And it's important to point this out because Tucker doesn't talk about her again, but his inclusion of her in this segment is what makes this possibly the most racist Tucker Carlson clip yet. One of them is a man called Justin Pearson. Pearson has been in the news recently for help. Helping to facilitate an insurrection at the Tennessee State House. You may have seen him, but you may not know what Justin Pearson was like before his transition. Back in 2016, Justin Pearson was an earnest young student at Bowdoin the whitest college in the whitest state in America, a place that costs 60 grand a year for no obvious reason. A rich kid school. Bowdoin is not the whitest college in the whitest state. In fact, it's not even the whitest school in its state, Maine, which is a state that lacks diversity, but is not the whitest state in America. That title would belong to West Virginia. Join the People's Pearson campaign and let's chart ourselves to a better future. 
I want to bring everyone together said Justin Pearson, in a voice that if you closed your eyes, you could easily imagine coming from a suburban orthodontist. Justin Pearson wasn't white, that's probably how he got into voting in the first place, but he did a fantastic impression of it. What a nice young man. Has he considered the apprenticeship program at Citibank? That was the old Justin Pearson before his transition. It is complete mask off, unmitigated racism from Tucker Carlson. I'm sorry, Tucker McNear Swanson Carlson, the heir to the Swanson frozen food family fortune. That's the guy who wants to talk about rich kid schools. The guy who wants to accuse someone else of getting into college, not because of his academic merits. Tucker Carlson, the definition of a rich kid who's had everything in life handed to him. So we can't be beaten um, on this policy wise. I think we've already won the policy arguments on the economy, on education, on a number of issues. I think we've got some work to do on the young people who think um, differently on abortion, perhaps, or guns or climate change. But even there, the Democrats' messages are usually cynical. The place I'm really the thing I'm really concerned about with this, Laura, is that the left becomes a turnout machine with young people. The Republican Party is completely against public education as a whole. I mean, look who was just the uh, education secretary in Betsy DeVos. Not, not only that, but when it comes to things like healthcare or the economy, who is it that's always talking against things like a minimum wage or raising the minimum wage or raising taxes for the super wealthy or just making the playing field more equitable in general? It's certainly not the Republican Party. And then she says, well, perhaps we can get better on things like abortion and guns. Well, you think? Our candidates lost the early voting miserably last time. I mean, someone like Dr. Oz lost the early vote to John Fetterman by over four to one. So we need to compete for ballots, not just voters and not just mine. But the Republican establishment is always speaking against things like early turnout or mail-in ballots or things that could actually assist them in winning elections. Influencers have this domino effect, lemming-like effect of people just all them wanting to be part of the same crowd. And if they succeed in that way, uh, we're not doing a great job competing for ballots. We're just be competing for votes. But if Republicans and conservatives in this country were talking about things other than, you know, the Bud Light uh, transgender campaign, you know, things like that, like, oh, they're trying to turn our beer gay. They're trying to turn everybody gay. The tr trans people exist. They're trying to turn our kids into trans kids. Like, if, if y'all would talk about something other than that, then maybe the youth would follow suit. But you're not talking about making the healthcare system more affordable. You're not talking about making education more affordable. You're not talking about lowering the cost of living in any significant way. Y'all ain't even talking about bringing uh, manufacturing back to the country domestically. You're talking about none of these things. So this isn't an issue of, oh, well, you know, the youngsters are going to get captured by the cool hipster influencers. And no, it's a matter of y'all ain't selling nothing. And, you know, what Lindsey Graham tweeted out not so many years ago was 100 percent accurate when he said that if we allow Donald Trump to win, we're going to be destroying ourselves and we will have deserved it. And it's absolutely glorious watching the Republican Party falter and crumble underneath Donald Trump. I mean, this man has this party in a chokehold unlike anything I've ever personally seen in my lifetime because the establishment Republicans, the insiders, they haven't liked Donald Trump since 2015. Yet they've been kissing his ass and helping him every step of the way ever since he's been running. And now, despite the fact, you know, let alone his history of tax fraud and ripping people off, when you just talk about stuff that happened while he was in office, being impeached twice and becoming the first president to ever be indicted, that's never happened before. So it's just absolutely hilarious to watch the Republican Party flail around, not know what the hell they're doing, not know how to get a hold of themselves. And then their assessment is, well, you know, it's just the woke, cool influencers and the hipsters. They're just making all these kids show up to the polls. Like, no, nah, it's that y'all suck and people are voting for Democrats instead. If you own a piece of memorabilia from evil regime, in order to demonstrate to your children, so the people remember for the future what that evil regime was, this means you're now a fan of that thing, according to Kevin Cruz. This, this is the actual thing they're going for. According to the Washingtonian, when Republican megadonor Harlan Crow isn't lavishing Justice Thomas with free trips on his private plane and yacht, he lives a quiet life in Dallas among his historical collections. These collections include Hitler artifacts, two of his paintings of European cityscapes, a signed copy of Mein Kampf, assorted Nazi memorabilia, plus a garden full of statues of the 20th century's worst despots, who is just a ridiculous human being, a pseudo-academic over Princeton University who has somehow avoided plagiarism charges that have gotten him kicked out of the university. He tweeted out, I've spent decades of my life researching and writing about white supremacists, and no, I don't have any paintings or statues of them in my house, because that's not something you do with the people you hate. What's he talking about there? Well, apparently, Harlan Crow collects basically memorabilia from defunct communist and Nazi states, and he has a garden in which he displays these things to show what the what the capitalistic free market and Judeo-Christian ethic has overcome. It's just the fact of Clarence Thomas hanging out with somebody who literally collects Nazi memorabilia and the entire right wing just pretending like that's a normal thing that people do. Like, oh yeah, that's the perfectly normal thing and definitely not indicative of your political views. Because the truth of the matter is that if somebody is running around collecting a bunch of Nazi memorabilia, that is probably a pretty good indicator of their political views.